uh, thanks to Buddhist Gen Fellowship for inviting me to talk on the series of e-learning, ropes and bowl, the Sangha. And this is the last lesson of this ropes and bowl series. And the title is Sustaining the Sasana. So here, the word Sasana means the teaching of the Buddhas or can refer to the Buddha's order. So I will highlight uh, these five subheadings and separately discuss and share my view on this subheading. I don't mean this talk as ultimate, but we can reflect on several passages from the suttas in Vinaya to invest, and also, of course, to investigate the long history of Buddhist development, why Buddhism declined and disappeared from the soil of India, and why Buddhism is also disappeared from Java, including Malaysia, and how should we sustain the sasana by contemplating uh, the Buddha's last advice to us on how to sustain the sasana from its decline, but to its growth and prosperity. And of course, uh, we also, you know, investigate our individual roles as Sangha and the laity in the Buddhist community. Of course, uh, we can, at the end of, the, of, of this series, we probably can give a lot of suggestion in how to sustain the sasana. Um, but I think living in the modern society like in Malaysia, uh, you know, particularly in Malaysia with different Buddhist tradition, uh, you know, those from Thailand, you know, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Chinese, or Siamese, you know, each having a unique Buddhist culture and how should we coexist together and appreciate each other's, you know, we face many challenges. And of course, uh, you can share your views and thoughts at the Q&A session. I think there is no answer to this, but I think we can share our views, our suggestion. Huh? And these are several uh, topics. Huh? for our tonight discussion. So I will uh, highlight them into this five uh, small subheading. Malaysian Buddhism faces several challenges due to rapid growth of Buddhist globalization. And the second one is a close relationship between monks and lay person and equal status. And another one is alienation from monks and lay people, the rise of laymen and the revival of Sangha and the last one is the future developments of Buddhism. How should we, monast we both monastic and laity, sustain the sasana by making good use of our, you know, specialty and latents, you know, to connect with modern society and to make Buddhism a vibrant religion. Okay, so this is our area we discussed. So in the past uh, several decades, of economic globalization, where Malaysian Buddhism has undergone its diversified development. So it was in the last century, I started from the eighties onward, there were many bit were established foreign based Buddhist organization established in Malaysia. Right to name a few, like Fo Guang San, you know, the Chizi Buddhist Merit Society, or Dhamma Drum Amitabha group, right, led by Venerable Chinko. The reason for its rapid development is one of the reasons is due to the advantage of using Chinese language to spread religion. And another one, of course, is a strong financial support and, and very structural you know, organization. So, other than you know, this Mahayana uh, organization, there were many Vajrayana groups quite well established and they are mostly headquartered in, China, in India. They also exercise a great influence over the Malaysian Buddhist and they have successfully you know, setting up a number of centers and monasteries in Malaysia in the use English. As compared to the Mahayana and Vajrayana or right, Theravada groups, impact are relatively small of course, scattered here and there, huh? and confined only in, in confined only to English speaking groups, and they are coming from Sri Lanka, you know, Myanmar, and Thailand. 
Then we find also another local Theravada group that is less known, you know, they are from the local Siamese community and they confined to Northern Buddhism and they use Siamese language and Malay language, yeah. So if we look at all these development, we can see of all Buddhist development, right? particularly from Taiwan Buddhist organization, their development is very rapid, right? Um, and due to the greater resources they have, you know, they have better experience and of course, uh, you know, globally connected organization support, and they were able to attract more followers than the local Buddhist organization. And there are positive and negative impacts, of course. And we look at the positive impact, right? And the positive impact is that they are coming to Malaysia, create competition. And competition in a good sense, a motivating force huh? for continuous improvement. And they are coming to provide a platform of learning. And that is to say uh, the local, Buddhist centers and temples and monastery are able to learn from them. And this eventually provides a very important ingredients, <laughs> you know, for the developments and growth of Buddhism in Malaysia. And the immediate positive impact is the awakening of Buddhism with more people attracted to Buddhism. There are also negative impact. One of the negative impact is the exclusive allegiance of followers to their own groups. That is to say, you know, they dissociate themselves from other Buddhist groups, or worse still, they disparaging others' Buddhist group. So such allegiance is a characteristic of many global organizations and which are founded perhaps on ideal, idealization of their respective supreme leaders and teachers. And besides, uh, you know, this so-called, uh, because this, what you call the genuine global Buddhist organization, we do find, you know, some other globally based, we call it the pseudo uh, Buddhist groups. Huh? They are also tapping the Malaysian Buddhist resources uh, or market. Huh? And, you know, so these pseudo Buddhist groups, huh, they're based in Taiwan and Canada, right? India. What else? USA, Australia, Japan. Yeah? And they were able to divert a significant number of Buddhists you know, to the organization. And they have the strength, same strength, of course, you know, as the genuine uh, global Buddhist organization. For example, you know, they are quite well endowed with resources and they are very, you know, they have a good experience yeah? and quite globally connected. So they establish a good connection with some, of course, yeah, with some local leaders yeah, of local ruling political parties. Uh, perhaps, you know, this is a way of securing recognition as a genuine Buddhist organization. And their presence has posed a great challenge to the developments of Buddhism as they you know, are dead, adulterated, you know, orthodox teachings of the Buddhists. So how Malaysia contribution to global Buddhism? Yeah, you know, to say Malaysia contribution to global Buddhism, one is the Malaysian Buddhism has the advantage of using multi languages, yeah? like, Chi like Chinese, you know, English, yeah? particularly. And, you know, they are quite proficiency right, to bring Buddhism to the world. However, Malaysian Buddhism is relatively less resourceful when compared to Taiwan counterpart, for example. I think one of the main reasons is that, you know, due to the absence of Buddhist education in school, right, we all know Malaysia is a Muslim country, right? So we have, very, we have no access uh, to Buddhist education in school. So our children has no knowledge or have very little knowledge about Buddhism. Of course, they are Buddhists, you know, just mostly by the namesake. Um, of course, you may ask, you know, we have a lot of Sunday school, right? Uh, you know, uh, providing, you know, Buddhist education in the temple, in the society. Of course, 
that's not that is far not enough, right? And many teachers, of course, if you look at them, you know, they are not well trained, or some even without anybody's knowledge, right? So they just read books, and then this is how you know they 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 impart the Buddhist knowledge, and we find that the students, the, the our young kid now lost their interest to come to the Buddhist temple to learn the Dhamma. So the per the absence of formal you know Buddhist education in school means that it is very hard for Malaysia to produce Buddhist leaders or academicians, right, who can eventually venture to the Buddhist, to the outside world. And in this situation, uh, we, we can say the Malaysian contribution, you know, to global Buddhism is quite limited. And to my knowledge, right, there has been no Malaysian-based uh, Buddhist organization that has established any significance influenced overseas. Of course, you may say, uh, how about Venerable K. Strip Damananda? I think most of you know him, right? Uh, he was Sri Lankan and he has contributed, you know, to the spread of Buddhism to many parts of the world. And we know many of his books have been translated uh, and some books even translated into 16 languages and distributed worldwide. Right? And many Theravada benefited yeah, from his book. Um, but of course, if you look at you know, Kestri Damananda, right? he, he did not attempt to build what we call the Buddhist empire, like what many other great masters have done. Mm, okay, so if you want to talk about how about Malaysian Buddhist contribution to the global Buddhist development, probably uh, this one is related. That is to say, you know, Malaysian Buddhists are quite well known for their generosity, especially building temple, right, in foreign countries like in India and Nepal. And of course, during disasters to help victims, right, uh, you know, kinds of, uh, you know, generosity. So this is pro probably perhaps a little contribution right, of Malaysian Buddhism made to the global Buddhism, made to the global Buddhist development. But it does not significantly contribute to the development of Buddhism in Malaysia. So, uh, from the earlier brief discussion, right, Malaysian Buddhism uh, faces several challenges due to the rapid growth of Buddhist globalization. To name a few, right, these challenges, I believe, too, are common to all Buddhists around the world. And the first one right, is uh, marginalization of cultivation, right? So in most of the temples, right, the emphasis on spiritual cultivation has taken a backstage. Yeah? And Buddhists now are more interested in social and recreational activities rather than spiritual cultivation. So, you know, in Malaysia, you know, more and more people are interested in Buddhism. But we find a lot of uh, Buddhists right, in Malaysia, but just a very small number of Buddhists are interested in spiritual cultivation. Like for example, attending to meditation retreats or, you know, or seclusion, right? That's why, you know, we are quoting, you know, our late chief, uh, Venerable Kestri Damananda. He said, our devotees, you know, like to, you know, run around here and there. <laughs> Right? instead of uh, you know devoting times to spiritual cultivation and the second one is a mcdonald mcdonald uh, digestion of enlightenment mcdonald fast food eh? um, so that is to say you know this is a kind of instance uh, fast instant noodles or fast food way of acquiring the so-called enlightenment you see, the public, especially many Buddhists, uh, they are expecting the instant result or the quick result. Huh? Uh, many, many years ago, you know, when internet was just popular, uh, many information can, can be easily obtained you know, from internet. And I remember one devotee uh, sent me a link which consists of a very powerful mantra. And of course, we're not understanding it at all with regard to the source of mantra. And he, he told me, that this mantra is very powerful, right? And it can bring a tremendous benefits to 
Bante, you know, you know, it makes it to me, like, ask me, you see, so you ask me, you know, no need to cultivate a meditation, right, so hard, huh? you just only want, you need just only recite this very short mantra, right, just even reciting one time will do, and that's sufficiently abundant, all your deformance and realize the instance, enlightenment, wow, double <laughs> you see, so many people are not patient enough to learn and practice over a long period of time right for example like in the meditation right you have to suffer the the pain etc etc so you know they, they have no interest right of course you know because of these instant noodles you know value of the public more and more teachers uh, are offering quick enlightenment uh, and because of that you know they draw a lot of followers and they become very popular and the third one is a commercialization of the tempers. You see, there had always been some form of commercial activities within the temple. Yes, eh? these activities are necessary to sustain the main role of the temple as a place of learning and worship. Uh, you know, that itself is not an issue. However, you know, when greed overrides, eh? some temple focus more on the commercial activities rather than they are original role. You know, the temple committee members and the monks, you know, spending more time attending to the commercial activities rather than attending to their primary spiritual role. So the end result is that some big temple uh, receive, you know, millions of uh, ringing uh, per year, but doing very little for the Dharma propagation. Uh, like spiritual cultivation or even education or for the sankha training, no such things at all been done. Yeah? Then the fourth one is alienation of monks. Okay, you see, you look at the primary role of a monk. You know, is the self cultivation, right, and preaching the dharma. You see, when monks do not devote themselves to the primary role, instead of spending their, their time on you know, organizational activities or administration or attending meetings or socializing with supporters and devotees, then their roles are alienated. So you see, through these ropes and bow series, and of course, I'm not pointing at anybody's organization, but to create an awareness, right, of revitalization, revitalizing, awareness of revi revitalizing or sustaining the Sasana Malaysia. But otherwise, Buddhism itself may be alienated, surviving only in name, and we must now wake up, you know, to face this reality. Okay, you see, traditionally, right, in our Buddhist world, there is this concept that the role of monk is to uphold the Dharma, right? The role of layman is to support the Dharma, right? Uh, you have this dichotomy, right? So this is the, you know, general, you know, traditional understanding. So what does it mean? You see, the so-called upholding Dharmas, right? If you look at the word upholding Dharma, it's nothing more than you know, self-practice and teaching the dharmas uh, or presiding, you know, over various dharma ceremonies. So it means, you know, when monks upholding the dharma, it means it is the monk's responsibility, you know, to uphold the dharma, you know, to self-practice and to teach the dharma, to preside over various dharma assemblies. So in the eyes of lay people, right, monks' duty and responsibility is just simply, you know, to uphold the dharma, that's it. Right, then you know, then what do you call uh, for the layman? Layman is to support the Dharma, and what is this support the Dharma? You see, it means you know nothing more than making offering to the monks or giving donation to build temples. Right, so the layman responsibility is to support the Dharma by offering requisites to you know to the to the sanghas and to donate money right, to build the temples. So it seems that, you know, this, this kind of uh, traditional understanding, okay? Yeah, this kind of traditional understanding, uh, creating, uh, you know, this uh, 
uh, dichotomy, a uh, concept. You see, that gradually lead to a view that monks are not real Buddhists and are the real Buddhists. They are the real practitioner and the lay people are just only a marginal supporters. Right? So there's an article right, in Buddha Net describing monks as players on the football field, right? while laymen were sideline supporters. Laymen role is to clap and shout, but not to play the football. So this concept margin, marginalized the role of the lay Buddhists and detract from the power of Buddhism as a whole. So it is mistakenly thought that, you know, it is a job of monks and nuns practice and teach the Dharma. Well, it is a job of laymen and lay women, right, to practice the five precepts and support the Sangha by providing them with their needs. So this traditional understanding, you know, this concept is very wrong. So you want a description, right, in the Buddha name, right, it is a wrong and dangerous concept. So in some countries where this concept is common, right, it, also, it leads to the pollution of Dharma. You see, the Buddha's goal was to develop a four-four assembly, right? Four-four community of disciples, right? Include, you know, the bhikkhu, bhikkhunis, right? And, and you know, the leopasaka, leopasika. And who were well-educated in the Dharma. Yeah, listen carefully. You know, this four-four assembly, they all well-educated in the Dharma, who practice it fully and who thought it to end to learn it from each other. Okay, so you see now, if you look at the, the present era, right, in this modern time, uh, Buddhism has developed into an old encompassing institution, which means, you know, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, uh, leopasaka, leopasikas are coming together to help spread Buddhism. So we find the support, you know, in the you know, from in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, you know, this Sutta is from the Deacon Nikaya. You know, the Buddha proclaimed that he would not pass away until he had established members of each of the four assemblies uh, are wise and well-trained and that they, they are also self-confident, right? So, yeah, this statement that is quoted from Mahaparinibbana Sutta, uh, which the Buddha has said, uh, in, to meet uh, Tumara, you know, uh, when shortly after his enlightenment, the Mara urged him to pass straight away into final Nibbana. Uh, no need to teach others. Eh? So, uh, you know, this is what the Buddha replied to Mara. You know, I quote from the Mahapar Nibbana. It says, Evil one, I will not pass into Nirvana until I have established members of each of the four assemblies who are competent, well-trained, confident, learned, upholders of the Dhamma, practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, practicing properly, conducting themselves in accordance with the Dhamma, who have learned their own teacher's doctrine and can explain it, teach it, describe it, establish it, disclose it, analyze it, elucidate it, and having thoroughly refuted rival doctrines in accordance with reason can teach the compelling dhammas. So this is a passage from the Mahaparinibbana Suttas. So we see the Buddha's original intention right, is to establish a group of four four assembly, or four, four, four disciples, you know, to study, practice, teach, and to promote the dharma together. So we find in Buddhism that the Sangha and, and laymen, right, both bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, leopasaka, leopasikas, are responsible, right, to promote the Dharma together. Okay, so it is wrong to say that, you know, the monk's role is to help uphold the Dharmas, uh, you know, the role of the, the lay people to support the Dharma. It is wrong. So, you see, in the Assam Suttas, right? Mahaparinibbana Suttas, right? uh, these Suttas, you know, supposed to be uh, the last Suttas. Huh? And we find a lot of, uh, you know, the advice given by, by the Buddhas, huh? particularly uh, 
these uh, seven conditions, you know, several types of seven conditions, right? And one sixth condition, you know, for the decline, for the non-decline of the Sankha, right? It, of course, it means for, you know, the Sankha's growth and prosperity. You see, uh, of course, I believe most of you have seen, uh, have read, have studied, you know, these this very important sutras. But I think, you know, these several conditions are worthy of our contemplation again, you know, for the growth and prosperous of the Sankhas. The Buddha again reminded us, you know, of the way the Sankha should live, you know, for the growth of the Buddha Sasana. Particularly, you know, we will go through that, you know, but the last one, uh, you know, the sixth condition, the Buddha says, you know, bhikkhus should show loving kindness towards other bhikkhus by way of body, speech, and mind. You know, I think we have to listen carefully here. Bhikkhus should show loving kindness towards other bhikkhus by way of body, speech, and mind, right? Uh, for the destruction of defilements. Furthermore, the Buddha also emphasized Whatever that received rightfully should also be uh, distributed among other bhikkhus equally. Right? And of course, the Buddha say, you know, deal with Vinay precepts and deal with right understanding. So in this way, there will be growth and prosperous of the Sangha. Right? And the Buddha Sasana will last long in the world. So now we look at, uh, you know, uh, anyway, we just read through them. I think they are worthy for our contemplation again. You see here, several sets of seven conditions huh, for the non-decline. Huh? So these are advice, you know, to the, to the Sangha. Okay, of course, I want to cut short here. Uh, the first set is the monks gather regularly and often. You see? So what does it mean? Monks have to get get together uh, often uh, for the growth, uh, not for decline. Uh, that's why we know that during the times of the Buddhas, a lot of monks are practiced through Tanga or they renounce in the forest, you see. But still, Buddha said you have to come out uh, at least once in fortnight uh, to recite Patimokkha together or to discuss the Dhamma, to discuss the Vinaya. Right? Uh, so, then the second one, they said monks gather in fellowship, uh, in group, uh, and disperse in fellowship and do the Sangha duties in fellowship. You see, it means that the Sangha has to live together, do things together, you see, and to disperse, to, you see, in fellowship, uh, sang, do the Sangha duties together. And the third one, monks do not authorize uh, what has not been authorized and do not abolish what has been authorized, but conduct themselves in accordance with the promulgated training rules. This is in Theravadas, you see, we still keep to these Vinayas. Uh, we have no any alteration to the Vinayas. And the fourth one, monks honor, respect, esteem, and venerate the elder monks. This is very important. You find in many suttas, the Buddha says, you know, we have to respect the elder monk. Huh? Elder monk, and particularly those long standing, long gone forth, Sankha elders, Sankha leaders, and considered it worthwhile to listen to them. Okay, uh, so the Buddha also says uh, monks uh, do not fall under the power of craving. Okay, and six monks love to deal in the forest, right? So, of course, now, you know, when you talk about the forest, indeed, forest is a very important place for monks' cultivation, right? So, sometimes we think, you know, if monks live in the, in the city, then how? Huh? There is no forest. Huh? So, that's why that also prompted, uh, you know, me to, you know, to build a monastery, you know, a little bit far from the city, but able to have a man-made forest built, huh? so that when this tree grown up, huh, we... You know, we can, we can do it in the forest. Huh? We can have very simple, you know, dwelling in the forest. Huh? Okay. Then, then another one, monks keep themselves up in mindfulness, you know, so companions in the holy life of virtuous conduct who have not yet come will come. Okay. And that who, uh, and they who have come will do it in comfort. So, so this is very important. So this is the first set. Yeah. 
And the second one is also another set of seven conditions for the non-decline. Yeah, so this is referred to monk already. Uh, monks do not delight in work, huh? uh, do not find pleasure in work, huh? are not caught with delight in work. <laughs> monks do not delight in talk, huh? do not find pleasure in talk, are not caught with delight in talk. Okay, it means that uh, don't be so busy. Huh? So monks do not delight in sleep also. We do not find pleasure in sleep, are not caught up with delight in sleep. And of course, monks do not delight in company, do not find delight, a pleasure in company, are not caught up with delight in company. The monks do not delight in bad desire, monks do not become bad friend. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think this Kalyana Mitha is, uh, is, is emphasized. Even lay people, monks as well. And monks also have to be a uh, Kalyana Mitha for the lay person, right? And we better not be a bad friend huh, for the lay people. And of course, monks do not stop short at, uh, of any lesser attainment. So, you know, monks have to strike until the attainments are hardship. Okay, now we look at another set of seven conditions, right? Of course, this one pertains to, you know, the seven noble, uh, you know, the wealth, huh? Uh, Aryadhana, <clears throat> okay? It means that the monk has to possess the faith, shame, fear, and of course, learned. Huh? Learned. Uh, learned here during, during the Buddha's time is, how do you call it? Uh, heard much. Huh? So that's why the devotees, you know, the monks, the sankhas, I come to listen to the Buddha's teaching, uh, you hear the Buddha's teaching again and again. Uh, it's called Bahusutta. And, and, and of course, uh, exert themselves, uh, in spiritual, uh, it means they're putting effort, right? Uh, in spiritual attainment and uh, spiritual development and establishing mindfulness, then only uh, expected the growth of the sankha, not their decline. So this is the third set. Now we look at another set of seven conditions for the growth of the sasana. Yeah, so this seventh set uh, is the seven factors of enlightenment. Okay, so I think we are, uh, we can just briefly look at them. What are these seven factors? One is the factors of uh, mindfulness, okay, organic factors of Dharma investigation, right? Dharma Pravitra, investigation of the Dharma, study of Dharmas, analysis of Dharmas, right? So, monks are, and of course, effort and with passion and with tranquility, what do you call and concentration and equanimity, okay? So, these are seven factors of enlightenment and then yeah there's also another set of seven condition right and this seven condition related to their uh practice okay practice it means that the monk will have to practice practice what they call the perception of impermanent perception of non-self perception of the fall the asuba sanya perception of danger Perception of lacking goal of defilements, perception of fading away of lust, perception of ending of suffering. Okay, so this is also another set of seven condition for the growth of the sangha. Okay, now we look at the last one, right? Sixth condition, right? This is the only sixth condition. Here it says very clearly that the monk showed loving kindness you know, the companions in the holy life by way of deed, okay? And the second one also by way of speech and the third one by way of thought, okay? It means that, you know, when monks live together, they have to show their loving kindness to other fellow brothers and sisters, okay? You see the power of loving kindness huh? is very important. Huh? So we don't show sour face all the time, right? And, and of course, uh, you know, monks mutually share with virtuous companion in the holy life, whatever they receive rightfully. Okay? And, okay, even the contents of the humble, what they have collected, you see? Um, then the fifth one, yeah, dwell, you know, in a moral virtue. And the sixth one, dwell harmoniously with right view. Okay? So, then only in this way, you know, they expected 
the growth of the Buddha Sasana and the prosperous of the Sasanas, right? And the Buddha Sasana will live long. <laughs> okay. Now we look at the second. Second one is a close relationship, you know, between monks and lay, lay people and equal status. You see, in the times of the Buddha, right, we find a close relationship between monks and laity, right? Yeah, are quite well established. And of course, we can say that you know, there was the most prosperous time huh? and you know, era of Buddhism. And if we, we, we find several examples, you know, to show you that, you know, the bhikkhu bhikkhunis, little pasaka, little pasaka, you know, they equally practice the dharmas together. Huh? And of course, you know, especially the little pasakas and little pasikas, they are not only made offering to the monks and temple, they also studied the dharma and they are quite well versed in the, in the Buddha dharma. And of course, they also help to promote the dharma and of course, for, for their own self-cultivation. And many of them have achieved the Sotapanna, right? For example, in the case of the first one, the Chitta of uh, Machika Sanda. Uh, so he was praised by the Buddhas as the foremost in the lay community to spread the Dharma. And he not only make offering to the Sankha community, but also propagate the Dharma, right? And he had thought 500 lay people to convert to Buddhism. And he also taught monks, huh? lay people taught monks, huh? <laughs> the Dhamma, you know, explaining to them, you know, the profound teachings of Buddhism. And of course, not only that, he also had a debate with Niganta Nataputta, right? The leader of Jainism, or naked, uh, you know, the religion, you know, and of course, the opponent. After debate, you know, the opponent becomes Mm, speechless. Huh? And of course, it says that the chitta also attained the anagami. Okay. Then we look at the, another story uh, is Hataka of Alavi. He is also another very prominent lay upasakas. Huh? And he is not known for making offering, but he is known for attracting people to come to see the Buddha and learn the Dhamma. So he also led 500 lay people, you know, to see the Buddha and taking refuge in the triple gem. And the Buddha asked him, you know, how to attract people to study Buddhism? He said, attract people with generosity, attract people with loving kindness, attract people with, uh, you know, beneficial action, and attract people with fellowship. Uh, so this is... Uh, the, the reply from the Hataka huh, to, Bud, to the Buddhas of why he can attract so many people you know, to take refuge in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha. And of course, looking at these first two stories, you see, they were quite highly praised by the Buddhas and respected by the people. Right? Hmm. Then we look at the third one, the elder Anatta Pindika, right? it's a famous supporters. Right, and we know that Anatta Pindik, right? He is a famous supporters among the Buddha's disciples. And he's not just only supporters, but he's a Dharma propagator, right? He propagated the Dharma. And he has refuted you know, the wrong views of heretics. Yeah. And of course, it says he has also attained the fruit of Sotapanna. The fourth one is Visaka. Visaka is a foremost you know, female devotee, a practitioner. And he has, uh, she has attained the fruits of Sotapanna, right? And, and of course, you know, in, several, in some other places, the Buddha also entrusted her to handle, you know, some affairs uh, in the Bhikkhuni Sangha. And, you know, King Sudodana, and we know that uh, he is the, uh, the father of the Buddha, right? And he's not just a king, but he's also a strong supporter of the Dharma, a practitioner. And he says that he also attained arahatship at the end of his life. You see, these are all lay people. Then another king, King Bimbisara. You know, we know King Bimbisara. He also attained the fruit of Sotapanna. And another one, Jivaka. Jivaka, he was, uh, you know, the, 
the physician, the royal physician. And he made offering to the Sanghas and he practiced the Dharma. It's, it says that also he has attained the fruit of Srotapana. Okay, now we look at the concept of equality between Sangha and the lay community. And of course, if you look at the con as this concept of equality between the Sanghas and the lay community, uh, we can see in the story of Chitta and the Bhikkhu Sudama. Okay, Bhikkhu Sudama made a very rude remark, right? And ridiculed Chitta's that the offering were not rich enough. Then, as a result, you know, the Sangha decided that the Bhikkhu Sudama should repay, you know, to this Leopasaka, you know, Chitta. And you find the Vinaya, uh, you know, two, uh, this one is from the Pati Saraniya Kama. Uh, the, the meaning of Pati Saraniya Kama is the procedure for reconciliation. You know, this, we now explain details how a monk should repent and apologize to a lay person if he or she has done something wrong to the lay person. And, you know, this, 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 this is expressed by the stock, you know, phrase is Katang, you know, dot, 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 tuang, kahapating, sadhang, pasanang, dayakang, karakang, sangha. Upatahakang hinena kungse sasi hinena wang behesasi. How can you jeer and scoff at a faithful, believing householders who makes give, who is active, who support the community? Okay, so we find this, yeah, and of course a few others as well. Uh, so we are not going to go into this, but we said that you know there is this concept of equality. You say a kind of mutual respect between the Sangha and the lay community. Okay, let me see. Uh, then next, huh? let me see. Then the third one is alienation from monks and lay people. Uh, we know that, you know, during the King Ashoka, right, who lived 2,300 years ago, right? Uh, he was a great king. Uh, during the third uh, century BC, huh? he was a great supporter of Buddhism, right? And he was from Gandhara also. <laughs> so it says that he built 84,000 stupas around India and abroad. And he sent, you know, my, my missionaries to different parts of the region to spread the Buddhism. So Buddhism indeed was flourished under the patronage of King Ashoka. And we saw four assemblies, okay, four, four assemblies, Biku Bikunis, Upasaka Upasikas, and other heretics. He also support other heretics as well. And they were all living very peacefully and harmoniously. And we know King Ashoka has sent one of the mission, missionary right, to Sri Lanka. He sent his own son Mahinda and his own daughter, Sankamitas, you know, and, so, and they, they, they you know, brought uh, the sapling of Bodhi tree. And you know, Buddha's two relics to Sri Lanka. And Sankamitas yeah, established a Bhikkhuni orders in Sri Lanka. So since then, Buddhism was flourished and existed until now. So we can say that Sri Lanka is the fountain of Theravada Buddhism. But after the time, after, after the times of Ashoka, we find the relationship between monks and lay person gradually become as train. Huh? That is because, you know, King Ashoka and, you know, the later king that followed, you know, they gave what they call excessive support to the temples, right? Resulting, you know, in the temples being overly luxurious and rich. And, you know, Master Yi Ching, uh, Yi, Yi Ching huh? uh, he was a Chinese traveler. He described this when they arrived in India, at the end of the third, 7th century AD. Uh, this is what he says, right? He said, the temple is so rich. The warehouse are full of rotten corn, countless female servants, and the treasury is full of gold and jewelry. Wow. <laughs> so this is the description huh, of these uh, very famous Chinese travelers when he arrived in India. You see, 
As a result of this, there is no communication with the lay people. That's why the temple don't keep too much money, right? If you keep too much money, then you need not any support from the from the from the laity. Then there is no uh, proper you know relationship, right? So then what happened is that you know lack of communication with the lay people. Then eventually, uh, you know, there are monks in the temple but no lay supporters, you see? So that's why, you know, that made Buddhism very fragile because when the inverters, they inverted India, you know, they burned the temple and they killed all the Sankha monastic members. That's what, you know, Indian Buddhism, of course, one of the reasons now, huh? but Indian Buddhism perished. And of course, you look at this, huh? there was no Buddhist outside the temple to protect the monastery. Right? I think that's quite true, isn't it? So, uh, we all know that, you see, uh, you know, the same situation also happens in Sumatra, right? Sumatra. Uh, from the 6th uh, to 11th century, we know that the Sumatra uh, was the center of Buddhism in the world. Uh, and there were many outstanding Buddhist monks like Dhammakriti, Atisa, and so on. Um, and of course, we know that later on, you know, and we know that the extend, uh, you know, this, uh, this Sumatra also uh, extend to northern Malaysia. Huh? Like we call it Lumba Buja. Huh? It's also the, you know, the, the spread of, uh, you know, the Buddhism in Sumatra. But later Buddhism also declined here. And according to one of the Muslim scholars, right? His name is called Sheikh Muhammad Nakwat Al-Tas. I don't know how to pronounce that name. It's just Sheikh Muhammad. Um, he's, in his book, he said, it is because the monks were self-enclosed in the temple. They were isolated you know, from the world. It means that there is, no relation, there is no close contact with the lay people because the temple was so rich, right? So, you see, say, you know, when in the temple, you know, when there are monks, but no layman support, you know, Buddhism will soon Disappear. So this is one of the reasons, contributing factors for the declining of Buddhism. Now, we look at the fourth one, is the rise of layman and the era of strong Sangha. You see, from the end of the 19th century, you know, to the 20th century, right, Buddhism in Asia, including Sri Lanka and many other parts, right, faced the danger of extinction. So at this time, it was fortunate that the rise of the lay Buddhists uh, and the reform of the Sangha were able to avoid this crisis. Uh, you know, in Sri Lanka, so in the 19th century, uh, under the devastation of Christianity, you know, Buddhism had severely deteriorated, you see. So, um, realizing the crisis, you know, facing Buddhism, the Buddhist Sangha began to revive. So, you know, these are a few, you know, uh, incident, a few uh, revival movement, right? It says that uh, in, in, in 19th century, right? Uh, Venerable, uh, you know, Walane Siddhartha, he started uh, Parma Dhamma Chetia, prevent. Uh, so, which was the beginning of the revival of Buddhist education. Okay, and then another one is, uh, okay, when you talk about the Pirivena, what is this Pirivena? Maybe you, you are not familiar with it. Pirivena is a singular word, right? Pirivena means Buddhist college, yeah? provides uh, Buddhist education, right, for, for, for Buddhist monk. And of course, this, the word Pirivena was uh, no long, long existed in, in, in the second century AD. Of course, uh, during this British and the foreign colonization, you know, all these Pirivanas were replaced by the missionary school. Okay. So, but however, uh, we see this revival of Buddhism by the Sangha. Is it Sangha really make an effort to revise? Yeah? Then, of course, we do find uh, another monk, or right, Sri Sumangalatera, where he founded the Video Daya Pirivana. And another one, you know, Rakmalani, Sri Dhammaloka, founded Vidyalankar Pirivena. And it, it says that the late, uh, uh, late our late chief, uh, K. Sri Dhammananda, also educated there. I was there also. I was staying there for 
many, many years. Huh? You see, when we look at these Sanghas, they were all pioneers in promoting the revival of Buddhism at that time. And now we look at the lay people. How about the lay people? You see, we know that the lay people, they are also quite vigorously promoted the Buddhist revival movement. And, you know, I, 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 I quoted three very famous ones, like Anagarika Dharma Pala, and what else? And Henry Olcott. And then you have another one, it's called the Dr. M. Baker. Okay, so these three person, uh, we must know their story. Okay, now we look at Anagarika Dharma Pala. He was a lay Buddhist practitioner, right? And of course, he advocated for the lay Buddhists to spread the Dharma and to protect the teaching, right? To especially, you know, to fight back against the Christianity, false accusation of Buddhism. So he went to India and started the Mahabodhi movement. Right? And he's striving to return the sovereignty of Mahabodhi Temple. We know that the Mahabodhi Temple is a holy place of Buddha's enlightenment, right? To Buddhism. So that is his very great achievement. And another one is Henry Olcott, right? Henry Olcott, and of course, he's trying to make Vesa a public holiday. And we know that you know, he also designed you know, the Buddhist flag. Uh, Buddhist flag, you know, you have very colorful Buddhist flag. They are now quite common, you know, to the world today. Then another one is the Dr. Ambekar. Uh, Dr. Ambekar. Dr. Ambekar, who was Indian, right? He led a large number of untouchable, you know, in South India, you know, to convert uh, to Buddhism. So it says, huh? Dr. Ambekar launched a movement to return to Buddhism. And he led 500,000 people at that time uh, to take refuge in the Triple Chain. You know, these, these people, they are, they are coming from the untouchable group uh, to take refuge in the Triple James and to uphold the five precepts. Yeah, but unfortunately, he was assassinated. So, of course, you know, from this, from this uh, movement, uh, we find, you know, um, Dr. Mbeka, the movement has rekindled the flames of Buddhism that has been extinguished in India since the 12th century. So, um, you know, in modern times, uh, many Buddhist groups, especially led by the lay community, lay men, uh, also established one after another. I think one very important is in 1950, Right, this four four assembly, four four assembly gathered in Colombo and founded the World Fellowship of Buddhists. You see, this establishment of World Fellowship of Buddhists right, marked the first event in the Buddhist history. Yeah, and when you know we, we had the Buddhists from from four assembly of all sects in the world, huh? they all gathered, you know, for the same purpose for the progress of Buddhism. And we find the president of this, uh, of this, uh, 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 you know, World Fellowship were laymen. Uh, and of course, the leader are mostly laymen. Okay, so now the fifth one, the future development of Buddhism. Now, after hearing, uh, you know, what we have said earlier, right? When we are talking about our future development, huh? so yeah, realizing the importance of the, the importance of this four four assembly, so we had to combine the strain, you know, of this four four assembly, you know, to make a joint effort, right? For this to be success, right? I think first monks and laymen must first improve themselves. Uh, in order to meet the challenges of the time. So what is the challenges of the time? Of course, uh, there are many. Uh, uh, of course, we, we, we hope uh, at the, at the Q&A session, uh, so you can share the challenges and the way to improve it. You see, now today we are talking about in this era of uh, you know, explosive, you know, era of advanced uh, you know, information and knowledge, you see, or, you know, generally people also have uh, very, very high education. It means that now so they, you know, everyone 
can easily access you know to the internet you know to learn buddhism to have an understanding of this secular topic even buddhism so in this sense we are no longer like in the past you know expect uh laymen to accept your teaching with respect and with blind obedience right because uh, you know like people now are quite well versed in the dharma you see if monks are not well trained in the dharma is it these lay, lay people they will keep asking questions inquiry la, discuss you see they study all teaching you know they were inquiry the monks huh? so so monks you know this is indeed a challenge for a buddhist monks. so for buddhist monks we are not just only shaving the hair you know and then live in the forest you know dissociate ourselves from the from the lay people from the laity so you know so we had to face that this is one of the great challenges yeah? and and of course you know in our era you know monks also have to lead the time and of course mm, <clears throat> you see when you're talking about the monks of course people will say okay you know this is an era of uh, you know very materialistic world right and the money is about everything else you see and of course yeah we know that <laughs> yeah but you know this is also about the challenge because you see in our sutta the buddha say you know monk you know we have to to lead a very simple life you know we have to keep the precept we have to purify our mind we have to be kind enough and we have to lead a very contented life you know to have a peace of mind so this is indeed, you know, monks, the sankhas, you know, facing these unprecedented challenges of the time. Okay, uh, so you have to find kind of balance, uh, find a balance in it. So I think the support uh, of the lay people is also very important. Why I say this is because you know in the past, uh, um, you know, you know the 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 road. That's why. Uh, people said the, the monks to uphold the Dharma, right? The main task of the monk was very simple. You know, they just practice, to, to practice, you know, the, or to educate the people. So, so you know, it's very easy to you know to establish a practical mode to to practice mode. But now today, you know, monks has to undertake the management of the temple operation. You know, have to have to take care of the funding fundraising uh, you know the communication you know facebook things like that and to socialize with the lay people as if uh, you know they're playing the role of the ceo of a company yeah you see you look at the you know the, the ancient days at uh, the temples um, or of the buddha's time you know mostly made of the detached what they call detached grass huh? they call kuti huh? very simple kuti huh? with detached grass huh? Uh, with very little material uh, and of course not any complicated uh, management but now we look at the temple so it's like a big company uh, even uh, bigger than some listed company you know so you know we look at you know we read recently an article that you know some temple in china you know the abbot is you know, like it played the role of CEO, you know, and, and turn temple into a listed company. I don't know. Huh? So, <laughs> you see, so despite all difficulties that the monk have to face, right, monk, you know, still have to adhere to the mold, to the, you know, to the model of practice of simplicity in, of life. Huh? And of course, to keep the precept, you know, to purify the mind, to be loving kindness and compassion, you know, to have peace of mind. So, you see, so this is a challenge for Buddhism. So if we don't maintain this role of Sangha, Buddhism will again neglect in the society and we don't gain respect from the lay people, right? So for a lay person, I know we talk about the lay person, in addition to culti continuing the traditional role of protecting the dharmas or to make an offering, you see, the lay people, they cannot expect monks, you know, to uphold the Dharma. They just only to, you know, to support. No, lay person also must practice the Dharma. Yeah. But fortunately, in Malaysia, we have many great, uh, you know, the lay communities. Huh? They are quite well versed in the Dharma, right? So, 
So yeah, like we have seen just now, you know, during the times of the Buddhas, yeah, they were many lay people. Uh, they are quite well versed in the dharmas, you know, they practice the dharma, they cultivate the dharma, they promote the dharma, and they're organizing the lay people to embrace the Buddhists. And eventually, they also attain the sainthood. You see. So the current trend is that you know now Buddhism, uh, also like many other you know great uh, bit uh, what do you call great religion, also you know grown into an all compassing uh, business heavy undertaking, you know, which means that monks are no more afford you know to handle this task anymore. So this task need to be undertaken by qualified laymen. Uh, for example, yeah, I mean, taking just example like, you know, monks, uh, uh, you know, of, of course, we say it's very difficult for monks to undertake, uh, we call it a chaplaincy, uh, chaplain, uh, chaplaincy, you know, in hospital and prison, which is very popular in the West. Uh, so it's very difficult for monks to undertake this. Uh, so, so we need to train or the temple has to train and organizing a high quality professional lay Buddhist, as we call in the in the US term, you know, Buddhist chaplain. Uh, so they are quite so this is this is this is very this is very what do you call? Uh, we need this kind of what do you call the Buddhist chaplain uh, for our future developments of Buddhism. And of course, you know, they have to be paid. Uh, a salary, yeah, of course, <laughs> it's very important. No? So, so you know, we are no more, you know, especially doing all these professional jobs. No? The Buddhist temples have to pay for that. No? So, I, I'm talking about you know the mutual support, you know, from the lady as well as for the sangha. <clears throat> so, our Malaysian Buddhists, you know, did need many uh, or need a large number of talented people to take responsibility in various uh, you know few huh? so and of course uh, you know the monks are to be well trained as well huh? so yeah that's why you know the buddha says um, if you become a monk you know you are no more receive a secular you know education right you need uh, to have a proper training at least five years but you want to go for an turret training and practice, uh, I think that need a lot in another 15 to 20 years. Okay. So you see, why I say this is because you know, if these areas uh, are not undertaken by a professional Buddhist, uh, you know, the layman, then you know the vacuum will be filled by other forces immediately. So you see, Buddhism eventually will automatically be out of touch with society. So in some society, due to the lack of Buddhist lay people in certain professional fields, you know, the Buddhist voice huh, are often not accepted. And of course, Buddhism, you know, you know is uh, marginalized. Right? So you see the monks, huh? um, you know, they are specialized. Huh? They are specialists huh, in Buddha Dharma. And they may not be proficient right, in some other mundane works. So some of these mundane works, uh, such as uh, what do you call, like the accounting la, you know, and negotiating with the with this what do you call the government officials, right, or organizing I don't know, you know, crematoriums, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You see, these will be more effective, right, if they are handled by laymen who are trained and professional. So. And of course, you know, in this era, you will really have to organize the lay Buddhists and making good use of their, their good talents. Huh? And that definitely helped to connect Buddhism with modern society and make Buddhism a vibrant society. Okay, now, <laughs> I have, a, I think I need to say something about this because, you know, many people, uh, asking me why you want to establish the temple because there are so many Buddhist society and Buddhist temples already in Malaysia, you see. But of course, uh, when we look at uh, <clears throat> all these uh, Buddhist centers, they are mostly lay-centered society uh, and lay-centered centers. Yeah? Of course, uh, you ask them, uh, this lay society, they surely will allow you to, you know, to, to stay in the temple, uh, to propagate the Dharma, right? I have, 
I have been uh, to many uh, Buddhist society, you know, and centers. And of course, uh, you know, personally to me, I find, you know, to sustain the sasana, indeed, it's not an easy task. Huh? And of course, you know, to, to coordinate with lay people, uh, especially lay people with different motive or affiliated with different tradition, and that caused an unavoidable, you know, complication too. So, you know, seeing all these complications, uh, you know, I established a new monastery, right, to sustain, you know, and to grow the sasana, right. So, in 2015, I registered a non profit company. It's company, right? It's, it's called non profit. It's called Brahma Vihara Monastery Retreat Center. And it is registered under the act of uh, company in Malaysia. The decision, the decision making, the decision body of Brahma Vihara consists of Sankha Council and the board of directors who are professional lay people appointed by the Sankha Council. So we have a group of professional uh, who consists of accountant, company secretary, and legal advisors to handle the Brahma Vihara monastery's matter. You see, the monastery, uh, Brahma Vihara monastery, was initially built in 2017, right? Started with, uh, you know, building of Simaho and the Sankha Kuti. And later we built international uh, meditation retreat centers, of course, with the female uh, dormitory. And now we completed the Theravada Academy multi-purpose schools and with the male, you know, dormitory. So now uh, we organize, uh, after MCO, <laughs> Or even before that, also we organize uh, various stay in retreat program, uh, you know, called a monastery stay retreat. And that stay in monastery, you know, stay in retreat, you know, we provide a spiritual uh, friendship platform. Huh? It's a Kalyanamita platform, uh, you know, for monks and ladies, you know, to come together and to learn and practice together, uh, you know, to encourage and to help each other for the spiritual upliftment and realization. And there is a beautiful <clears throat> teaching uh, in which the Buddha's cousin, right, Ananda, comes to the Buddha and say, Oh, blessed one, huh? I figure out the spiritual friendship is half of spiritual life. Then the Buddha says, No, not so, not so, Ananda. Don't say that. I don't say that. It is not, don't say it is just half. It is the whole of spiritual life. So you can see the Buddha emphasized the importance of spiritual kalyanamitas platform for Sankha and laity, you know, to learn to get to practice together, right? So this is assurance that the spiritual friendship is the whole of spiritual life. So we continue conducting retreat. It's also, you know, another way of associating with spiritual friends, uh, associate with uh, like-minded people, you know, practicing together for our continuous experience of inner peace and joys. And finally, you know, reaching our goal for our own real, for our realization of ending of all deformities. So thank you very much.